Hello and welcome to Misfits and Rejects, a podcast about expatriates and the artistic way they've styled their lives around the world. I'm your host, Chapin Cruder. Enjoy. I didn't fit in America. Find yourself shipwrecked in a far off place and Dale, welcome to the show. <laughs> Try not to plan too much at all. You know, just be spontaneous. And quit the limiting stories. Really try to overcome that fear. I'm gonna sail again. I'm gonna have one more. I got one more sailing. Love her, but leave her wild. But it didn't work for me. The American dream wasn't gonna work for me because I didn't fit the American dream. I had respect that I was a young squam. Now I'm an old guy, and I respect myself. You know what, Jacob? I'm a secret fan. And I prefer to just be secret. And if you can figure out who Dale Dagger is, then figure it out. And if you can't, then go. Welcome to another episode of Misfits and Rejects. I'm sitting here with Don Gomez, a Mexican expat living here in Nicaragua, who has lived a life second to none from anyone I've ever met at this point in my life, which is why I'm so excited to have him and hear his story, because... He's seen more and done more and shaped his life in ways that I think will inspire people to maybe take a look at what they're doing and question if they're doing something they sh- they don't like, they're not passionate about, that maybe it's time to stop and go seek out those things that you're truly passionate about and find your purpose in life. So with that said, I'd like to welcome Don Gomez to the show. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chapin. Pleasure to, to be talking with you. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you because you've lived a life where, I mean, you started, you were born in Mexico, you made your way to America with your dad, who is an intellect, graduated from Berkeley. Um, you, you've seen the life of a criminal, you've seen the life of an intellect, and you've seemed to find, find your purpose at a very young age, which I'd like to really kind of get more into because you saw an opportunity to expose the world to the injustices of, I think, many different cultures around the world and what was happening with your war correspondence that you did. And um, throughout our conversation this evening, we kind of left off with, I think at this point, where you found this passion and what was growing inside of you to really go out in the world and expose what was going on to, to tell the world, hey, like, there's a revolution going on in Nicaragua. And I need you to understand like what these people are fighting for and, and, and I'm the guy to do it. I'm just crazy enough to actually go into a war zone and put a microphone in front of these freedom fighters and, and hear their story. So why don't we just start where we just left off, which was you were finishing, um, what high school? Yeah. And, and you had an opportunity to, to give a speech to your high school class and then some asshole teacher flunked you, which you, you couldn't, you couldn't give that speech to your high school. Yeah, it broke my heart, broke my mother's heart. Uh, but at 18, you're resilient and strong, and, and you, you come back fast. I went to Berkeley, and at Berkeley, they were very, very unimpressed with my uh, my foundering uh, journalistic needs. My I remember my first good story, what I had been assigned to do by the Daily Count, was the Library Budget Review Committee. Now, this is a near-death sentence for an idealistic young reporter. So what I did instead was I saw in the paper that Miles Davis was playing in San Francisco at the Jazz Workshop. So my compadre and I go over to the Jazz Workshop, and Miles, like all the other beboppers, uh, Miles, Charlie Parker, Bird, um, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, John Coltrane, they all had one thing in common. A great Cuban musician named Machito, whose real name was Francisco Lopez, had influenced them because he introduced them to sixes, to Latin rhythms that they had never heard before. And they were fascinated by it, and they improvised and used it in all of what we now know as bebop today. So while we're waiting outside, and in these days, Miles Davis didn't even give give interviews to anybody. He wouldn't let you take his picture. Uh, He talked to Ebony Magazine and Downbeat, the jazz magazine, and nobody else. But I sent word in that I was the nephew of Francisco Lopez, which would have been true if I had been Cuban and been his nephew. 
and within minutes, somebody brings comes out and they bring me in, and they take me into the large dressing room where Miles Davis was a little guy like me. Miles is, and Miles says, "Get your your uncle's a great man. Have you eaten anything yet?" I said, uh, uh, "No, sir." And he said, "Bring the kids some red beans and rice and a steak." And from nobody to him having lunch with Miles Davis. And I asked him a million questions, because when you're 18, you got a million questions. And he was polite, he was civil. I mean, Miles Davis was not a polite or civil guy, but he was very, very, very nice to me. And because when you're 18, you know no limits, I asked him at the end if I could take a picture. <sighs> That's how deep Miles' sigh was. But he said, okay, kid, your father's a your uncle's a great man. And let me take a picture. I go back to Berkeley Chapin. I got a two-part interview with the great Miles Davis with a photograph. I'm no longer with the Library Review Committee, okay? And right there, for any of your listeners, a lot of what I was to do in the rest of my life was formulated by the fact I just went and did it, goddammit. Yeah, I told a little minor lie, you know, but Miles never found out. Machito never found out. Nobody got hurt, you know. And I got an exclusive scoop with Miles Davis. Um, I, uh, I continued from there. I began freelancing more and more. I did, uh, stories on the rock and roll that was emerging, all the music of the sixties. I did the first interviews with Carlos Santana, Jerry Garcia, Jose Feliciano, Sir Doug, uh, all the Latin guys. I, I did stories with them. Um, and, I began freelancing in Southern California, uh, wrote about the Chicano riots in East L.A., wrote about Bobby Kennedy. I was there when Bobby Kennedy got shot. That was my first big front page story, you know, um, crying because I was there. I wasn't even there as a reporter. I was there with Chicanos for Kennedy, and I had met Bobby twice, and he got my name wrong both times. And the third time, he got it right, and he was laughing. Um, and then there he was, 25 feet away, dead. And when we were heartbroken. But I wrote about it all night. So finally at 7.30 in the morning, Frank Mankiewicz came out and said he was dead. Um, and so I, I moved from California. I got a, uh, I, I had, since I had flunked out of Berkeley, all my support from the home base was cut off, you know. My father told me to go well in the world and let him know where I was living and what work I was doing. So I finally got uh, into um, a situation where I could take nine units at UCLA, so I decided to study film. And I took uh, nine units, and, and in the middle of that, we were smoking some weed one night, and we discovered uh, this song that we love called Now That the Buffalo Are Gone, written by a, a Native American woman, a Cree Indian woman, Buffy St. Marie, and we are like... <sighs> Hey, that's really a good song. It's like a movie. So we made a movie about it. We went out and we got pictures of buffalo and pictures of Native Americans. And then we found a place where they had buffalo. They were growing buffalo in Orange County, California. And buffalo are very stationary. You can throw rocks at them and they won't even move. But finally, one of our guys kicked him in the ass and that got him going. You know, they turned around. We got this great shot of the buffalo charging. And, you know, we're doing this on a 16 millimeter camera that we bought at a pawn shop. And so then we, we, uh, okay, we found some old daguerreotypes of buffalo hunters and they're massacring buffaloes on the, on the high plains, horrible looking crap. And, uh, so we, uh, so we don't have any people. So my compiler remembered that on the first of the month, when the Mexican Americans and the African Americans and the Filipino Americans and the Native Americans, when they had to go get their check, they all got kind of dressed up to go, you know, like to go have a little dignity. And, Cause that's a humiliating experience. And so we're there and everybody that looks like a Native American, we stick the microphone in front of them and ask them about now that the buffalo are gone. And we got this response of like, how do I know I'm a Chicano, you pendejo? And, uh, and somebody else, another guy, we ask him, and he says, he says, I'm a Pimo Indian from Santa Barbara. I've never seen a buffalo in my life. But finally we got a guy. I remember grandfather telling me of the days when the buffalo ran and our people were rich. 
we got into the National Student Film Festival. First time out, first flick. And we competed against a guy who won. And when this guy who won got up on the stage to get his prize, he had a big Jimi Hendrix afro, little John Lennon glasses, uh, a Frank Zappa goatee, a coat made out of curtains from a Motel 6, and the head of the Mersh Corporation, Walter Mersh, looked at him like, what in the hell have I done? But George Lucas did okay. That's George Lucas. That was George Lucas. His first film was THX 11380. He did a, a short subject that he filmed for the Long Beach Naval Hospital. But again, it was a question of just get the damn camera and do it. Just do it. Okay. And, uh, so I, uh, I had refused to go to Vietnam. My compadre and I both, right after Muhammad Ali said no, we said no, we're not going. No Mexican, no, no Viet Cong ever called me wet back. So I'm not going to fight him. And uh, long story short, three years of appeals, getting ready to go to Terminal Island Federal Prison. I was convicted and sentenced to Terminal Island, three years, which meant 22 months. And people said, why, do you, why don't you you know, do alternative service instead of going to prison? I go, yeah, what's that all about? You know, I say, well, in, in Orange County, that meant you worked at the... Long Beach Naval Hospital as an orderly. Bedpans and scummy work. Well, what the hell? They're veterans and you don't have to be in prison and you don't have to be in jail at night. Well, to do that, you got to take a physical. I go take a physical and they go get halfway through, they go get dressed for 4F. What's 4F? 4F meant you didn't have to, you weren't eligible to be in the army. Okay. 13 months and nine days later, I landed in the Republic of Vietnam as a correspondent for the San Francisco Chronicle. So you did time, and then they sent you to Vietnam? No, I didn't have to do time because I opted for volunteer service. Oh, so they did let you do the volunteer so, service. So, no, I didn't have to because I was 4F. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I had spent three and a half years worrying about it. Okay. So, okay. Um, so I get to I get to Vietnam, and, you know, like, it was all falling apart. There's a... Uh, a famous picture uh, of a of a GI in Vietnam with on his helmet it says FTA, which is Duck the Army, and uh, uh, we were there when that was happening. Okay, and uh, uh, the best and finest men I've ever known, but the war was wrong. But but I humped with those guys. I hyped with humped with guys from the 101st Airborne. I, I was on uh, canal duty with both the Coast Guard and the Navy, uh, went on recon missions with the Marines, and uh, whenever there was nothing to do, we went to the American Embassy to the 5 o'clock Follies, where the U.S. Uh, spokesman told the latest lie of the day, you know. One guy had figured out that according to all the statistics, we had killed more Vietnamese than there were. Really? Yeah. Um, Morley Safer, God rest him, who just passed away, said he was told by uh, a diplomatic attaché that if you believed the army, you were stupid. But you know what? It wasn't like this crap of nowadays where they call embedded, where they tell you what to say. You can't go on a mission unless you say what they say. In Vietnam, the American press corps stood head and shoulders above the rest of the world. They went everywhere and reported many, 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 many fine men and women reporters reported the truth about Vietnam and that brought the war to an end. Was um, it censored, the stuff you reported? No. Hell no. They didn't dare. They didn't dare. We had them, we had them on the ropes and TV put the first war on TV. I wasn't TV. I was just newspapers, you know. But it set me up to do other places. I went to Angola. I was with the Cubans in, in Angola, West Africa, um, where I would talk in a very loud, exaggerated Mexican accent. Andale cabrones! So nobody thought I was Portuguese, okay? Um, learned a lot there about, you know, we were with uh, a leftist government. The Cubans were who, was who we were running with. Uh, I was in, I went to Morocco, uh, 
to assist some people in buying uh, some uh, stuff that rhymes with uh, smash heesh um, and, uh, and ended up covering a coup when the Air Force tried to kill King Hassan. Um, the reason being, what your listeners want to know is because I was there, because I went. I didn't know Morocco from my butt. But just by being there, a story happened. Okay. And you were um, always interested in the story. Always, yeah, yeah. I uh I had all I had gotten pretty good at freelancing. You can't live off freelancing, but you could travel from one place to another. Um and that was all I gave a damn about at that time. Um so I had gone I went to graduate school in Madrid, at the University of Madrid, with Georgetown School of Foreign Relations. And uh and it was fun, but it kept interfering with my reporting, you know. Um, so I fell in love with this Puerto Rican lady and went back to the States to be with her, and that busted up. So I took my thesis, which was in a box, and went back to California and got a job working for the legislature as a translator. And so they sent me out to a new TV station to... You should probably mention it when, when I was working my way back into the academic world, I got an acting scholarship to New York University. And, uh, my father, uh, loaned me the money for my tuition and shaking his head told him my brothers and sisters that, well, if the homosexuals didn't get him, he'd be okay. Um, and, uh, they didn't get me, but I sure knew a lot of gay people. Um, so anyway, I had a background. I'd done stand-up comedy. I'd done act- serious acting. I'd sung and danced in shows. And uh, so I go to this, this uh, the Sunday morning ghetto where they have the Asian-American show, the African-American show, the Mexican show. And, uh, and I did the interview about bilingual education. And afterwards, the director goes, hey, you look like you could go to sleep up there under those lights. You know, you're very comfortable on camera, aren't you? I go, yeah, sure. I said, well, have you ever thought of, of being a news reporter on TV? And I go, no. What do you want me to do? He said, well, we'd like to have you read the news for us. Turn it on. So I read and and I said, do you want me to talk in my broadcaster's voice or do you want me to talk like I really talk? You know, and he said, well, in between. So, okay. Uh, so they gave me the job. And uh, so, you know, uh, one fine Thursday afternoon, I'm suddenly the chief anchor man at a brand new television station in Sacramento. Big, big, huge market. A few days later, I'm sitting in the, in my newly designed office. The TV station's even on the air yet. And I'm talking on the phone. Orale, vato, que paso? And he goes, you speak Spanish that well? And he goes, my first language. He goes, well, we want you to do a news report in Spanish. And we're going to make you news director of the TV station. So, okay, at the bright old age of 26 and a half or 7, I'm now the news director of a TV station in a major market. Chapin, I was bored within weeks. You know, being in the newsroom, listening to my, my pipes as I read the news, I was just bored to death. So I, I found a, an attractive woman to read the news in English, and I made myself the capital reporter. So I could stand in front of the, the beautiful white capital with a, uh, a Burberry trench coat and, and give the summary of the politics in the state of California. Work with Ronald Reagan, work with Jerry Brown. Um, it was great. And I did well enough that a, a, a station, another station drafted me. And then when I was at that station, uh, okay, I'm going to see Jackson Brown at the Greek Theater in Berkeley. And on the radio comes the news of this place I'd never heard of called Jonestown in Guyana. I tell my date, drive me to the airport. She goes, what do you mean? I have to go to Venezuela. She said, why are you going to Venezuela? So I can go to this Guyana place. It's Friday night, okay? By midday Saturday, I'm in Guyana. Nobody told me I could go with else my weekend. So I'm starting, I'm doing phoners for everybody and their mother. Because I'm in Guyana and they're not. I still have crap from there. Made in Jonestown, People's Temple. Um, so and of you, course my television station said, yeah, you know, pump it out. They left me be, they'd be there four or five days, you know. So Send you're a sitting camera. there interviewing the, these cult members in Jonestown. Yeah. 
and sending the sending it back. Sure, sure. And oh. what was your overall impression of that? Like place? And oh, people? it's horrific. Nine hundred people dead everywhere. Mostly Kool Aid, but maybe fifty or hundred of them shot. Jesus, Christ. it was just. I covered the trial later in San Francisco. It's just unbelievable. I knew about Jim Jones because Jim Jones had the ability to put a thousand people on the streets for Jimmy Carter, for uh, Willie Moscone, uh, Willie uh, Brown, George Moscone. Uh, he was a political factor in the Bay Area until he went crazy. Um, but again, to your listeners, I just went. But why the what's driving you to go? Like I mean It's a great story. Just just to be the guy who got be the there, story. yeah. To see what's really yeah. going on and get that story. I don't wanna look when I was doing dope, I didn't have anybody tell me about it. I went to Oaxaca and to Panama and to Colombia. Mm-hmm. I went to those places. I didn't want anybody to tell me about it. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do it, you know. Um so then ABC and the, you gotta understand that we're talking about the mid late seventies, okay? Everybody needs some minorities. So I get drafted by NBC. They want me to go to St. Louis. Hell, I take the, the free airplane trip, but no, no, no. No St. Louis. No, not this millennium. So then CBS drafts me, and they send me to Denver. Much better than St. Louis. A lot of Mexicans. But it's cold as hell, and it's Denver after all. And then ABC drafted me to San Jose, California. Fastest growing city in America. 30-something percent Latinos. Yeah, I'm home, baby. And uh, so, same thing. I was there a couple of years. I did lots of stories that, you know, good stories come from people. They don't come from the assignment editor cutting something out of the newspaper. Good stories come from people you meet in parking lots. People come from people you meet in a coffee shop. People you meet in a third world village like People this. you meet in a third world village. And so, and this is how we're, we're going to transition into Nicaragua. Nicaragua, there's always been a colony of Nicaraguans in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're talking about since the 1840s. They went from San Juan del Sur to San Francisco to go to the gold fields. True. On the, on the, the clipper ships. Well, People from the, I had enough of a good reputation with La Raza, with the Latinos, that people knew they could approach me and give me a story. And I thought, hell yeah, sit down, tell me about it, you know. And I'll never forget I had this woman. She was an Irish nun. She spoke Spanish like the India Maria. And had a lift to her voice when she talked in English. And she'd give me stories about these slumlords and how they were screwing over people. They wouldn't fix anything. There were rats. It was a horrible place. We made that guy's life a misery for two weeks till he finally fixed some stuff. So people see these <clears throat> these stories and they go, oh, well, that's the guy. You know, we'll talk to him. <clears throat> so three, four people from the Nicaraguan community come to me and they go, Donaldo, you have to go to Nicaragua to show the world about our revolution. I go, you're right. I have to go to Nicaragua to show the world about your revolution. And... Uh, and so I offered the gig to ABC. Everybody had a correspondent in Managua. ABC turned me down. I had a cameraman who had been with CBS with Morley Safer and those guys and Ed, Ed Bradley in Vietnam. Aussie guy. Tremendous cameraman. Been in Vietnam 12 years. And I called him up. We used to knock back a few 10 or 20 pints from now and then. And uh I said, No, Mike, get us into in the Nicaragua. And he goes, No, Mike, thank all people there. And I go, I can get us in with the fighters. We're on. So flew to San Francisco to Santa San, from San Francisco to Mexico and Mexico we met some people. So Mexico is always a clearing house for revolutionary stuff. Fidel and Chase, Andino, Farabundo, Martin, everybody runs through Mexico one way or another. We're kinda of like the big brother of revolutions. And so we, I register in this hotel and people come see me and they tell me, okay, now you got to go to San Jose, Costa Rica and San Jose, Costa Rica. You're going to register at this hotel on the fifth floor, send your guys out. Somebody will come get you. Sure enough, somebody knocks on the door. They take me up to the next floor. This is a Balmoral, which is a 
A kind of luxury hotel in San Jose, Costa Rica. A lot more luxurious 37 years ago, but anyway. So, and we go into a study, and there's the Junta in Exile in this suite. And they quiz me, am I going to be fair? And they go, I might do better than that. <laughs> so, so, so they, they give me instructions to fly to this little town of Liberia on the Costa Rican border. So I fly to Liberia and again register in this place. And I register in this place and then go to the pharmacy. And in the pharmacy, the pharmacy asked for Annalisa. And I walk in and there's a man and a woman, both indeterminate, 30 ish age. And I go, is that Annalisa, por favor? From behind the counter comes this little seven year old girl. Just like Annalisa. And she takes me out of the pharmacy and walks me into a neighborhood. And here is this middle class Costa Rican home. And the people, they have a screen door open. And through the screen door, I can hear, Starsky y Hutch. I go, no. This is listening. They're middle class people listening to Starsky and Hutch in Spanish. This is not a revolutionary place. And she tells me what to say. And I say, what is it? And they invite me in. And then they take me in the backyard. And there's a guy with a gun. And it's on. It's and on in the sense like we're leaving right now. You're coming with me. and we're 15 gonna, minutes. 15 minutes. We're out. Let's go. So go back to your... He knew exactly where we were staying. Yeah. Go back there, get those guys, we'll pick you up in a truck, and you're going to spend the night in the mansion. I go to the mansion. Ah, oh, like Hugh Hefner, that's cool. We pull up in front of this place with some collimated front, you know, semi-mansion, and, and we go in the kitchen door, and there's dead and dying people everywhere. It's a trauma hospital. The worst casualties from the Nicaraguan side have been evacuated this place. People are are moaning and crying for their mother. There's not enough medicine. And it's just horrible. Five o'clock in the morning, we roll across the border, and they take us right to Comandante Cero, Eden Pastora, and we're live you're with the a, Sandinistas. You're in a combat zone. Yeah. This is your second combat zone since Vietnam. No, no third. third. So you had Vietnam, Angola, and now Nicaragua. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, nine weeks. And we... Uh, we sent video back to the Costa Rican border. They flew it to San Jose, Costa Rica. CBS sent a plane. They put it up on the bird. And there we were. So it went really well. Everybody was happy. So by 1980, when I told ABC that I wanted to go to El Salvador, because I knew that it was going to blow, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 we'll help you out, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I spent a lot of 1980 in El Salvador, and I did it, and it was just, the horror of El Salvador is different from the horror of Nicaragua, the horror of Vietnam. Let's talk about that, actually, yeah, because now you've seen Vietnam, Angola, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and what's your overall impression about the situations going on in each country, the, it, what's just about it, what's unjust about it, what's... Well, in... In Vietnam, the death of 17 Vietnamese at My Lai was a cause for international scandal. In Nicaragua, the death of two journalists, an American and a Nicaraguan, caused aid to be withdrawn. In El Salvador in the year 1980, 50,000 people were killed. Now, to give you some perspective, in the 12 year long Vietnam War, the United States with 240 million people lost 50,000 people. Imagine a little teeny country with 4 million people and they lose 50,000 people in one year, not 12, one year. Massacre. Massive murder everywhere. Um, they killed the Monsignor, the Archbishop of El Salvador, they put a bullet in his head. Four American nuns who were friends of mine, they raped them and murdered them. This is where you got shot up too, isn't it? I got shot in Salvador three different times, yeah. I'm very democratic. I've been shot by the government and I've been shot by the rebels. Um, and uh, one time, the third time, uh, they were moving me with the dead people. El Mexicano está muerto. Saying, oh, no, 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 I'm not dead. I just don't feel good. Put me on the helicopter. Um, and... Uh, uh, but El Salvador was the worst, the absolute worst. Um, and the United States just couldn't understand that they didn't have, there was no way to win that war because the guerrillas were popular. 
Um, at the same time, Reagan started funding the Contras and Nicaragua, and they couldn't win because they weren't popular. And I was hop, skip, and jump from Honduras to a press conference uh, with uh, Cap Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense. Then I go back to El Salvador for a gun battle. Then I go to Nicaragua because they said that uh, whoever, whatever they said about the Nicaraguans. Um, and so I did a film in El Salvador about that year before the war, 1980, a film called El Salvador Diary. And that film was the only documentary to ever win both AP and UPI award for best documentary of the year. Nobody else, not Michael Moore, not Jacques Cousteau, nobody but me ever did that. Congratulations. Uh, was it was, and that was, like, now I got to play with the big boys, okay? Now I could get funding to do documentaries. Now, pretty much, the networks would take what I told them I had. Uh, if I told them they took it, I never said I got this and they didn't take it. And I could write for newspapers like the San Jose Mercury News or the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, and they'd take my stuff and put it on the op-ed page. Okay, There were not a lot of filmmakers that do both, trust me. Mm -hmm. um, in those days, maybe none. Um, so, I I stayed in and out of Central America. I did uh, El Salvador Diary. I did uh, a, a film uh, about the deportees, the thousands of Salvadoran migrants, uh, Im immigrants, illegal immigrants, who were deported and sent back to certain death. Did a film called Buelo de la Muerte. Eventually, we stopped these death flights. Not me, we, but people like Jackson Brown, Martin Sheen, Joan Baez, uh, Mike Farrell from MASH. Um, there were a lot, a lot of good American uh, artists and musicians and so forth that, uh, that, that helped to stop that. Uh, then I did a film called Ballots and Bullets about the fact that elections in El Salvador were a farce because if you didn't have a cedula stamped, it meant you were a, a communist. So everybody voted no matter what. Um, and by the, the mid-80s, taping, I'm sick and tired of doing daily news. So I get together a crew, most of the guys have been in Vietnam, and we go back, we got a budget, and we determine we're going to live in a village with a Salvadoran family. They got three kids in the army. And it's pretty hard to say I'm a communist if I'm living with a family that's got three kids in the armed forces. And we're 50 yards from the, uh, the main quartel where the Green Beret advisors, 35, 40 Green Berets are. We're out on patrol with them all the time, okay? But what I wanted to do, Chapin, was to build a movie that wasn't current events. I wanted to show people what it was like to live for two years in a town in the heart of a war zone. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody else did it. i just never seen it or heard about it. But that's what we did. We had two crews. We lived with this family. And we documented what would have been the boring everyday life. Except in the middle of the Civil War, there's no boring everyday life. But we didn't do news reports. Um, now and then, at the Heed the Master's Voice, I'd do something for CBS to keep the money flowing, but not much. And uh, and we came back. After two years. After two years. You lived with yeah. a family in a war zone in El Salvador, making a documentary film. And just because your viewers are never going to, your listeners are never going to see this film, all three sons died during those two years. Jesus Christ. And we were witness to it. We, 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 we paid for the caskets. We, we helped them to the degree we could. Yeah. And we came back. And by now I'm really mad. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm really mad because I've done everything I could do, I thought. And it's just the war drags on. So we, we cut the film without any permission. Uh, I build an opening video of Bob Dylan's song, License to Kill, with Carlos Santana on guitar at Budokan. And we send it to Dylan to get approval, because we can't afford $50,000 for his music fees. And for the first and only time in his entire 50-year career, 
Bob Dylan gave permission for a song to be used and no money. And then Peter, Paul, and Mary wrote a song for the close to the film. And we put it in 92 film festivals all over the world. Moscow, Cannes, Venice, Telluride, Denver, San Sebastian, all over the world, Hong Kong, Tokyo. 92 film festivals in less than two years. That's a new, that's a festival every week, okay, all over the world. And I had this crazy, insane producer who, he would back us up. Um, give you an idea, he sent me to the, sent me to the Versatel to get some money to buy an eight ball. And, uh, and I got 250 bucks out and he said, do you want a receipt? And I hit the yes, automatically hit the receipt button. And the receipt said he had $17,872,412. I go, we need another eight ball. <laughs> and, uh, but this guy, he funded the film to the tune of three or $400,000. And the film looks like it cost $47, okay? The lighting is crappy. Uh, it, it's just because that's what it is when you're living in a war zone, okay? Um, but it won festivals outright. Uh, second, third, uh, we got the, uh, Leon, uh, D'Argento in, in Venice. Silver Lion. Um, we did really well with it. And in the meantime, I had, I had helped co-script a movie, a Hollywood movie called Salvador. Oliver Stone and the protagonist in that movie, James Woods, is called Richard Boyle. And Richard Boyle was a babysitter for my kids. And the guy who was with me in the first year of making this two year movie, the first nine months anyway. Uh, and that got all, it got good, good reviews, good press, got nominated for an Oscar. But still, the war continues. And, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I didn't know what else to do, you know. And I'm walking down the mall in Santa Cruz, California. And here's these three guys with an open guitar case, and these guys just got it from Mexico like yesterday. And they're playing Brahms and Beethoven and Bach. You know, and they got long hair and they're, they're in Levi's. And, and then they play Jerry Garcia and then they play Santana. And I go, gentlemen, step over to the cantina. I'm your new producer. Now I knew less about producing music than my dog over there does, okay? Mm -hmm. But I knew what I wanted. And these guys, we did songs about Central America. And 13 months later, these guys were opening for the San Jose Civic Light Opera, taking $3,500 for a set. And we were selling 10,000 copies of a cassette. Home, you know, I mean, not homemade. We recorded in the same place the Doobie Brothers did. But, and I want to tell you, and I don't talk about this very often, but there came a time when we got all the musicians in the studio because I got him a trumpet player, a guy who composed for Charlie Park, Charlie Bird. I got him a, a great percussionist from Puerto Rico. Um, and everybody's in the separate sound studios, and we got 32 channels, which was a lot in 1988. And got an engineer on one side and his other engineer on the other. And they go, this is it. This is the moment they're going to find out what a hopeless fraud you are. That you don't know crap about music. A one, a two, a one, two, two. And everybody comes in running. I go, yeah, that's what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. So, if you want to make music, make music. Okay? Um, Real quick though, why can't I see that documentary on El Salvador? I'll show it to you. Is it like, could anybody see it? Could any of the listeners see it if they wanted to find it on Netflix or in, in some uh, No, somewhere? but we're going to put it online. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, um, let's you have to understand that the world in 1988 is just like uh, the gladiators in Rome in terms of electronic stuff. Okay. okay. I have the goal for this year to build a website with about... I've made 28 films. I think I have nine of them in my possession because I loaned them to the Committee for Solidarity for whatever. And they, they have forgotten to send it back to me. Um, and, uh, you know, when I Google myself, I have to feed 
the right information to even get my goddamn name. And I've been in television since 1974, okay? But most of the great stuff I did was 74 to 90. 90 is now 25, a decade, uh, uh, a quarter of a century ago. So I'm building a website, yeah. Mm. So you can download videos and movies. and Because um, the truth is, I really only care about the next project. That's all I ever cared about. What's anyway. the next project? My next project is five years in the making, almost six, a film about the California Delta. That uh, It's the largest delta in the Americas, except the Amazon. has 1,400 miles of coast. And there are elements in the state of California that want to build uh, an underground tunnel the size of the Panama Canal, like the tunnel, from around Sacramento to the Central Valley. And it will be the biggest monstrosity in the history of modern water irrigation planning, etc. So my film is going to be called uh, Death of the Delta. And uh, like I said, we've been down there filming off and on for six years now. And uh, that's, that's my, my newest project. Um, I, uh, I done a lot of things. Uh, it came a time when I was like a walking, uh, poster boy for PTSD. All the stuff I'd seen in those places all caught up with me. And, uh, I had to make some real big changes in my life. Uh, I've been sober 27 years. Okay. No drugs, no alcohol. And, uh, it's the best thing I ever did. Uh, I already had enough. And, uh, but that meant some other changes because being in Hollywood with, uh, you know how they say F you in Hollywood? Oh. Trust me. <laughs> and that's not good for somebody who's trying to stay sober. Uh, but I worked off and on. I worked in, in Hollywood as late as, uh, 2007 or 8. I wrote a script that's never going to be seen, uh, based on the book Killing Pablo mm -hmm. by Mark Bowden, who did uh, Black Hawk Down. Uh, they paid me a, a fortune. I probably built that room over there with the money they paid me. It's never going to be made. Uh, I, I, I made no money. Uh, the network made, paid me good money. Uh, Hollywood paid me good money for a small window because if you're even affiliated with an Oscar film, for two or three years, everybody wants you to come to their party and everybody wants to pick your brain, you know. But by the 90s, I had left Hollywood. I was, I taught college, uh, did a whole lot of other things. I became a drug and alcohol counselor. And then my father got Alzheimer's and I spent seven years taking care of my father. Um, and I wish it could have been 10. Uh, but in 2003, I had some bonds that came to fruition. My vengeance on Hollywood, who so was buying some tax-free bonds. And uh, so I, that's where I got the money to come down here. And I built the little bodega that's behind the hotel. Um, and But the plans were always for the big house, for the hacienda. And that took uh, another 10 years. But I had no idea there was anything good, touristy, uh, surf, any of that stuff was just like, you might as well be giving me a weather report from Mars, you know. Because what I saw in Nicaragua was AK-47s and rocket launchers and no diesel and no food and blown up bridges. And uh, it was just crap, you know. Mm -hmm. But see, I was gone from 92 to 2003. A lot happens in 11 years. Absolutely. And uh, so I, I saw this. Gigante Bay, and they that's it. Mm -hmm. I when, bought when did you see Gigante Bay? 2003. 2003. So you've been in Nicaragua in the 70s on the southern border with the revolutionaries, and you'd never come to the coast. You didn't know this place existed. No. And you're you're a Mexican, like seemingly that your heart's in Central America. How come you never went back to Mexico? And Too expensive. Too expensive. Too much the violence right now. Mm -hmm. There's no violence in Nicaragua. Nicaragua was peaceful. Mm-hmm. Everything that Ronald Reagan thought was true was the reverse. Nicaragua was the most peaceful country in Central America. Chapin, I bought this lot the day I sat in it. 
I bought it and I never looked back. So presently you are a hotel owner in a small little village in the southern Nicaragua called Gigante. And you're not officially retired because you have this documentary on the California Delta in process, but you're here living most of the year just enjoying life. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's a nonviolent uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> country. No, I, in 1991, they, CBS asked me if I wanted to go to Iraq and I said no. I don't know. I think somebody said Afghanistan. No. I don't want to see any more of that crap. Ever. You know, that's why I love because that's why I don't go to El Salvador because there's a lot of violence in El Salvador. I won't, I won't subject myself or my friends, my family to any of that. Nicaragua was wonderful. It's peaceful. I got a beautiful home with my partner in California. My lady's got, she's there taking care of stuff right now, you know. Um, the up, way up in the Oakland Hills, beautiful. Um, I'm going back Sundays or something. No, Saturday. Going back Saturday. Um, but, no, I, I was born a Mexican, I lived as a gringo, and now I'm going to die Nika. Because um, it's a wonderful place. I'm a, my heart is here. Your um, heart is here because of the past experiences you had here, or just your overall? Everything. everything. The Nicaraguan people are among the most open, generous, and I'm a proud Mexican, but these are open, generous, forgiving, tolerant people. They have an, an, a, a degree of compassion to me unparalleled in my life experience. And I've been damn near everywhere. Um, they don't care that you're in North America. Oh, that was the government. They understand that. That's, that's a huge philosophical leap. In Mexico, we're still mad about the Alamo. You know, it's different. Um, and I have found in, in the, the heartfelt sincerity the integrity, uh, the great sense of humor the Nicaraguans have. Yeah, man, I love this country. When I sing the song Nicaragua, Nicaraguita, my voice breaks. I get tears in my eyes. That's how much I love Nicaragua. I feel the exact same way. What's the name of your hotel? Hacienda Amarilla del Mar. Hacienda Amarilla del Mar. And it's a an honest replica of a 19th century Mexican hacienda just happens to be on the beach in Nicaragua instead of in Mexico. So that was the inspiration to build it like this? Yeah. Sure. It's absolutely gorgeous. You've done amazing down here. And thank you so much for talking to me. This has been a pleasure to hear your stories. And I know we could go for hours more. <laughs> but uh, I yeah. don't want to keep you up too late. So thank you, Don, for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Have a good night. Thank you for listening to Misfits and Rejects. I hope this inspire you to think about your life situation, where you're at, and possibly make a big decision to choose something different for yourself if you're unhappy with where you're at in life. I hope these people that I interview inspire you to go out, spread your wings, and try something new, to live a different lifestyle that maybe your whole life people were telling you was the wrong one, but when in fact it, it's the perfect one for you. And I'll see you next time.